Hi, everybody. So glad to be here with you um, at all of the times that, of day that it might be for each of us. Um, my name is Nicole Savita. I am here to tell you a little bit about a project called EcoGather that um, I've been a part of for the last two years. And I'm actually getting to return to this space to talk about it because um, two years ago at this the first version of this conference, um, I got to present on it when it was just an idea. And so it's really particularly rewarding to be back, um, to be able to tell the story of what we've done and to seek more inspiration and advice about how um, we might continue to grow this. So I'm gonna take just a moment to get my screen share situated. Um, but that file I put in the chat has links to the slides in case it's easier for you to open them outside of Zoom and follow along on your own. Um, it also has links to things I've linked in the slides so that you can um, access further information and resources now or after um, and ways in which to contact us and follow along with our work as well. All right. We call EcoGather, which I'll tell you a bit more about, takes a little while, education that makes sense in a world that does not. And I'd like to ask everyone right now just to let that phrase settle in for a second, education that makes sense in a world that does not. And just listen internally for the first thing that pops in your mind. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just sharing in the chat in whatever the language of your heart is, um, what comes to mind when you hear that phrase. What does that mean for you? What do you think it might mean? What does it call up? Hmm. Feels like you're all here in a very similar heart space as we are. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way and on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. I'm sharing this because I see the word collapse in the chat. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And before I jump into collapse, I always like to remind people that out of the collapse, we get to rebuild, to reweave, and to reworld. And so start with the memory of the future possibility. Nothing is wrong and everything is wrong which is a way of saying that a whole bunch of breaking ideologies and systems are functioning exactly as intended, but breaking ways eventually break themselves because there is only so much to take, to break, to foul, and to obliterate, and so eventually collapse. We think of collapse as a kind of trouble. It's the kind of trouble, though, that advances the plot. It cracks things open, and it reveals the futility of resistance to change. And so I'd like to start us by bringing you all into a mini exercise um, that hopefully will give you a sense of how we organize an EcoGather. Um, I'm gonna ask you one more time to place something in the chat and that something in a moment will be a combination of the place you root into, and please interpret that in whatever whatever comes up for you. That could be where you are, that could be the place you call home, the place your people are from. Um, then to identify a teaching that you're called to offer others who are not in your place, who are beyond your place. And some aspect of your identity or experience to which that kind of teaching is particularly closely connected or related. And then to identify something that you might be curious to learn from others, something that might be of use in your community, in your endeavors. And so that might wind up looking something like that in the chat. That would be my offering as an example. So I'll put the instructions and the example back up and give everyone a moment. I'm gonna give us just another minute here. And if you need to keep typing and thinking and sharing as I move forward, that's totally fine. What I'm noticing is how 
intentionally people are describing the places that they root into, and the ways in which their identity connects with the things that they are most moved to offer. Um, and while not everyone has gotten to what you might want to receive yet, um, I bet as we get there, we will find as we have in Ego Gather a lot of complementarity between what people can offer and what people can receive um, or are looking to receive. And sometimes um, we don't even know that we are holding on to something that someone else might value uh, or want to learn until we hear the ask. And so that's been a really important part of Eco Gather for us. I'm going to move these windows over. So what we're doing right now is a little micro dose of how we formed our network in Eco Gather. We of course did it over months and hours and working relationships, but this tiny bit of how we exchange from our places, from ourselves, from our identities to co-create new educational tools, teaching and learning resources um, to share amongst ourselves starts very much with the same kind of exercise. And so with that opening, let me give you a little bit of a roadmap for the rest of our hour together. I'm gonna to talk a little bit more, get a little more specific, a little more concrete about the motivations, the origins and the defining characteristics of EcoGather tell you a little bit through that probably about who I am and um, who I have here with us tonight, works on the project, brings it into being. Um, and then we'll start talking a little bit how we began connecting and animating the Eco Gather Partner Network and who is a part of that network. I'll give you a little glimpse at what we've woven so far, some reflections on what we've learned and um, ways in which we're bringing those reflections to the world. And then I have kind of a big question that we're grappling with that I'm hoping we can live together. Of course, the map is not the terrain, the terrain is always changing. And so if at some point um, the group would like to see this go in a different direction, has questions, wants to spend a little more time in one place or another, please feel free to raise your hand. I can't see everybody with the screen share on, so raise your hand, flag down our host, put something in the chat and we'll try to make sure that the space is a really shared space, the best of our ability. Okay, so EcoGather is really inspired by David Fleming's system scale rule. Large scale problems do not require large scale solutions. They require small scale solutions within a large scale framework. And EcoGather took root, began, at Sterling College, which is a really, really small college. Um, we have at best, at our fullest, about 120 students at any given time in our residential program. Um, we live in a, we are located in a really rural place. We live together in that really rural place. Um, and we believe in small scale solutions to just about everything, including education. Um, but we also recognize that if we're only on that hilltop together, things get a little provincial. Um, and certainly we can only reproduce our own ways of knowing. In our case, agriculture and food systems, which is a big part of what we teach and focus on at Sterling, we can play with the pieces and reconfigure human society with that knowledge and the image of the natural world. And that is a way to ground and activate hope in really dark times. Um, we're trying to also do something different with online education. We're trying to turn distance learning into place-based education. And for some um, lifelong adherents and practitioners of place-based education, that feels really controversial um, because the idea of doing things digitally feels anathema to being place-based. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how we try to do that. And then we're trying to also build bridges between um, the digital classroom space and asynchronous spaces and interactive social action networks and we're trying to make sure that what we do is accessible to people who might not otherwise have access to this kind of education. Um, but you'll see I've highlighted the words affordable and accessible, and we're definitely coming back to those because I think they're really tricky and particularly challenging concepts. So 
So how do we bring online learning to life? By now, you know, we're grounding in community-centered design. We're um, complicating place-based education, very inspired by David Greenwood's writing on critical pedagogy of place, um, which is now a couple of decades old, but really, I think, was ahead of its time. And then we're trying to make sure that what we do create um, has always has experiential application. Um, so there's always a way for someone to step away from their computer and reflect, apply, try in their community. Things are module, modular, um, and that's so that we can always take them apart and put them back together to serve a different audience, to meet a different need. Um, we try to make it full of content that are multiple means of representation, multiple modes of learning. Um, we want it to be really engaging and, and diverting because we're kind of, many of us, saturated in a very entertaining, um, algorithmic driven landscape when we're on screens and on our phones. So if stuff comes in like a kind of dry packet, um, we're just not conditioned to want to engage that way through a screen. But we're also really careful not to like be overproduced in that content because we want it to feel real and be real and representative. So there's a line there. Um, and we try to create an aesthetically alluring interface that constantly reminds us of what is actually offline um, and out in nature. We're beginning to be able to facilitate interactive discussions and support real world application in our partner communities um, and use of these resources that we've created. And we're also now starting to host some welcoming virtual spaces to create those connections. It's really important to for us to be making sure that we're using digital technologies to foster exchange, but really rejecting the pedagogies, the algorithmic tactics, the gamified incentives that keep people tied to their laptops and mobile devices and discourage engagement with life. And there's a whole separate slide for this here because it is the thing that I feel I have to say most often when I am um, talking to people who are environmental educators, social change educators, um, food justice educators, the point is to blend, but not to use the worst of those tactics. So let me tell you a little bit about the network. Um, as I said, it is started at Sterling. And so I guess we hold the center, but we don't put ourselves in the center of the network. So if I were drawing a diagram, it's not a hub and spoke. We're connecting across all of the networks. And after um, about 18 months of active work together, our, our network partners are starting con to connect directly to each other on their own and collaborate um, in interesting ways. So that's getting to be fun. Our partner communities. I, I wish I had time tonight to tell you all about them. Actually, I really wish they were here to tell them, um, tell their own stories to you about themselves. Because I don't, on that link list I gave you, um, I included a separate set of slides that are profiles of each one page profiles of each of these partner organizations um, and a little bit about what they've contributed so far to EcoGather and also just the work that they're doing in their places and communities. So we work with Frontline Farming, which is a BIPOC and women led urban food justice organization and farm in the Denver area. Um, the Gross National Happiness Center in Bhutan, which I think maybe most folks tend to be familiar with Gross National Happiness in this space. Um, and we worked with them just at a, place, at a point in time when they were beginning to, um, beginning to work with farmers and um, starting their Educated Young Farmer program. A newer entrant to this space, the Matipani Asha Center at GSG College in Umarkade, India, which is working um, with farmers at one of the epicenters of the Indian farmer suicide um, challenge and one of the dual exposed hotspots in the world. So um, pretty deep economic underdevelopment uh, and some of the worst climate impacts already and projected and they're working on transition to agroecological methods um, and, and recovery of indigenous knowledge there. The Puerto Rico Science uh, Research and Technology Trust, which has done a lot of work in Puerto Rico on agroecological and agroforestry transition, especially in, um, in response to many of the hurricane disruptions that they've experienced. 
and Plenitude Puerto Rico, um, an organization that is more of a community-based and action organization there, running farms, doing really interesting natural building and rainwater harvesting and management, um, holistic nutrition work, um, very similar in many ways to frontline farming, um, but in a different geography and culture and community. So when we, we had relation, pre-existing relationships, um, friendships, I should say, not necessarily institutional relationships with some of these organizations. We were newly introduced to others um, and we started to come into contact with them and explore what it would be like to partner through EcoGather. And the original grant, which I did not write, um, was, was written by a predecessor for me at the organization, um, imagined that we might provide some resources specifically to help the partner organizations like build a course of their own or take this and do something with it, but not to really engage with us the whole, the whole way. And as I started thinking about what it would mean to deeply co-create EcoGather together, I realized that we were going to have to balance judicious stewardship of the philanthropic funds, especially at our really small, very under-resourced college. Um, and I'll just be very, very straight with everybody about that. This is not a wealthy institution. Um, it's not one with lots of deep pocketed donors. And so when I first said, I want to give a lot of this money away to our partners so that they, we can really deeply resource their work um, and, and be fair and equitable in compensating them for the knowledge that they're bringing into our network and into our institution um, and make them really have the capacity, create that ease in there so that they can meaningfully and actively participate with us. Um, so we created these very flexible subgrants um, and you know, kind of emergent, spacious scopes of work of what we were gonna do together um, on the way in and we shared the resources that we had. And then we did not walk into this with a predetermined curriculum or a set of courses we knew we wanted to create. We really spent several months working together, um, getting to know each other and kind of sketching the contours of a curriculum much through in the same way as um, the exercise I just did with you. So really I'm doing that in conversations, also in spreadsheets and things, figuring out what could people offer and what did they need and where were there other organizations offerings um, that one of the partners would put their hand up and say, yes, we, would, we could absolutely use that. We don't have that knowledge in our community. Or we don't have an expert practitioner. Um, and then places where maybe everyone would say, actually, we could really use this and no one here feels kind of capable of doing it. So who else does Sterling know in their network that we could bring in and work with together? Um, so, so that was how we kind of got to an expanded network also of consulting scholars, but they're really all also consulting practitioners. And at the end of this grant cycle, um, all of the partners will have access to all of the teaching and learning assets that we've created during this period of time in perpetuity to use in their communities. Before we got any further, so once we had a sense of what we were gonna build, but before we started building, um, we had to build trust and we had to create some guidelines for ourselves to make sure that we were not being extractive as we were starting to lift up and hold that knowledge and put it back together in these different ways. Um, and so there is linked for you, um, a link to our whole set of story ethics, which are much longer than this, but, um, and they provide more kind of practical and tactical guidance about how we make sure that we're handling stories with care, that we're collecting and using them consensually um, with ongoing consent, and that we're really fostering authentic non-essentializing expression and representation. Um, and I don't have time to go through all of that with you, but I do think it's a good resource. Um, and it also has links to the resources we used and were inspired by as we started writing our own. I'll take a moment to just note, um, I haven't introduced myself yet and that's by design. Um, obviously there's a little bio on me. Um, I am the Vice President of, for Strategic Initiatives at Sterling College and the EcoGather Project Director. Um, but that's maybe the least important part about this. I have this team, many of whom are here tonight. Um, Nikasi Fortune is with us and she's been with the project since before I, I have um, and has really just keeps us going in all of the ways, keeps us organized and has, has very, very gracefully managed to move through all of the changes um, 
and different emergent stages of this project. Um, Heidi Myers, top left there, um, is our creative direction, marketing, storyteller, communications person at the college. And she has really big courage and really big heart. And she's um, what some people would call brutally honest, but I would call beautifully honest. Um, and she is really, really good at distilling down complexity into words that kind of capture the essence and the feeling. Then there's Anissa Coit, who um, has a brain totally not like my own. She's all science and art where I'm more words and systems and um, justice stuff. And so she's this amazing compliment uh, and she's doing a lot of instructional design work for us and works with our partners and consulting scholars in that way. Mackenzie Faber also does a bunch of that and also facilitates our learning network. Um, she, on the other hand, has a brain a lot more like mine, owing in part to the fact that she was one of my students in graduate school. Um, and so is also a food systems person. Um, but I, I point that out, not because she's like a mini me or anything, but because part of what we were actually able to do was take a bunch of stuff I had been teaching and hand it over to her to um, make better, to remix through the eyes of a student and a learner and to transform into something um, that had a different generational lens, that had a different tone, that really held on to delight and joy um, and generative energy as we were studying all of the hard stuff in the food system. And then finally, there's Connor Ferguson, who is our multimedia producer, who is um, always making us look and sound good. We record so much more than we actually need to put into a course. And he finds all of the best bits of that um, and makes it cohesive and compelling, but not fake and synthetic, which is so important. So together, this network has woven a catalog of courses that's linked there. And I'm gonna go through a couple examples in a moment. Um, but what you see on the screen within the screen in front of you is what it would look like if you logged in um, or logged onto the catalog for our platform. And in addition to the partners being able to access the courses um, in perpetuity, right now we're also selling those courses a la carte to anyone individual anywhere who wants to log on and participate in an asynchronous learning experience around those topics and those courses. Um, here is a list of the courses we've created. So there's a cluster of Surviving the Future courses, and I'll talk in a moment about that as really a kernel and, and another part of the origin story of this. Um, a series of change shaping courses, a cluster of courses on relational food systems um, and the skills within that and then a cluster of courses around farming with nature. So I'll just pause for a second because rather than read through this, I think it's useful to just be able to look at it and soak it in for a second. can tell there's been a bunch of chatting, but I haven't been able to follow it yet myself. So I will catch up on that. Any thoughts, questions? Hi, Some Nicole. Hi. I have a question for you. Yeah. Now I see all the kind of system and people that are like well organized, but I'm really curious to know how was at the beginning, how many staff do you have how you start like the fundraising, how all this, you know, how were the first steps of yeah. this amazing uh, family or project? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the very first steps happened before me. So I didn't tell you a lot about my background, but um, I was faculty in sustainable food systems at Sterling starting in about 2015 to 2018, I stepped away for a little while and went out to Colorado. And then I came back in the role that I'm in now. And in that space in between um, the relationship between Sean Chamberlain and then Chelsea Green Publications, which publishes the Surviving the Future and Lean Logic books, and Sterling started forming. And out of that was this, this kernel, right? That we wanted to grow into something bigger. So first the education around um, David Fleming's work and Sean's work and, um, 
lean logic and lean economies and in the context of collapse, and then building that from a symposium into a course, um, enabling us to go back to the funder and say, okay, now we wanna put it into practice. We wanna put the theory into practice and create that larger framework in wh within which the small communities can, um, can exchange their knowledge and, and the lessons from practice. And so that grant was written before I came back. Um, and there had been about a year where they had hired sort of the technical folks to do the work, but because of all of the COVID dislocation and disruptions, even though we had Nakasi to do some of the project management, we had um, a video content producer and an audio content producer. We didn't have partnerships yet. We didn't have a sense of what we were building. And it, you know, let's just chalk it up to 2020 and early 2021, like it was, it was not easy. Um, and so I came in to a fairly blank slate and um, when, when there was a leadership change and I was able to pick up a couple of partnership conversations and then also be able to say, okay, well, I have some relationships with organizations and um, groups that are a really good fit and let's, let's explore that. I would say, gosh, it's getting a little fuzzy. I'd say it probably took about five, six months for that to really cohere. Um, during that time, we built some other stuff I didn't talk about because we had people to do that needed to be doing things and doing work. So in addition to that team, helping our college manage some of the like going remote and distance pieces for um, our bachelor's degree program, we also created a podcast and did some early um, audio and video storytelling with our partners. And then we started, so we our team has never been more larger than what I showed you on that, um, that slide of all of us. Um, and so we all wear lots and lots of hats. Um, you know, Mackenzie and I do the graphic design um, with like a little help on, you know, getting the initial logo and colors down and things from our contract designer. He, he does things to enable us and teaches us what to do. And then we go do it ourselves. And Connor does all of the audio and all of the video now. Um, and and so what we've done is we've really created systems and processes to engage with our partners and our consulting scholars um, and all of the like guests who we bring in for other perspectives to streamline it. Um, Mackenzie, I'm going to put you on the spot for a second, but because you're the one who does a lot of that, do you want to just speak to a little bit of what the course creation process is like? Yeah, sure. And let me know if my partner is drumming downstairs. So let me know if you hear some music in the You're background. Good. Okay, wonderful. Um, so the process varies a lot based on the kind of course content, the original vision of why we wanted to put this in in the first place. It's not like, you know, we have a registrar's office saying, hey, like we really need a math class. It's really up to us. Um, so that means that it changes a lot and it changes based on who is in the network. Um, a really good example is our kitchen gardens class um, developed by the Matapaniasha Center um, and based on a conversation that Nicole had with our dear friend Betsy. So we get together and we let Betsy talk about, you know, what has growing the garden looked like and if if you had a class when you started this, what would you want to know? How would you want someone to guide you through the process? Betsy brings the ideas and I bring the structure and I fill in wherever Betsy needs support. I come with outlines and I do a little ghostwriting if Betsy is off doing the many other things that Betsy does. And then we kind of get together, we talk every two weeks, Betsy and I become best friends. And once we have something we're really happy with, um, I start moving it into the platform. I make sure it's accessible. I show it to Nissa. We're um, two halves of one brain. Everyone else gets to look at it. Connor and I record things to figure out where we need to fill in. And Nikasi starts to kind of get the word out about the class. Um, and it ends up being this really huge and collaborative and beautiful effort. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, that's what yeah. I was hoping you okay. would share. <laughs> and, and I think the only step in there that you missed is that we also at the outline stage, um, once we have a decent outline with some you know, meat on the bones, we'll share it with the whole network so that folks can comment and say, oh, this part's really useful. And what we're, you know, here's how we might use it, or here's what we're looking for um, out of that. Or say, like, 
we were developing, um, we have a soil plant and fungi course that we're in the process of pulling together. Um, and, you know, folks from Bhutan were con contributing some content, but in through conversation, we realized that in almost all of the communities, there were different mushroom going, growing projects going on either at those organizations or with their close colleagues and friends. And so then we figure out, okay, who else within the network can we bring in and feature and how many different maybe climates or um, growing methodologies can we interweave in here? And so it's a very emergent process. I will tell you that at the beginning, like the partners were all looking at me like, wait, we're doing what? You want us to commit to what? And I was like, I want you to commit to just being in it. And like, kind of in a crass way, I was like, and we're giving you money so that like, you know, that, that like, at least it's not going to make, you're not going to be in a worse off spot. Right. And so we really, we like had some basic expectations about like each organization is going to really, really go all in on and lead with us on one class, um, maybe two, depending on their size and their scope. And then like is going to show up and participate in the others when asked. And they have, they've been great about it. Um, I would say that like, if I'm speaking really realistically, <sighs> Maybe I had some ideas of, that it would be even more robust, but you and like I think we all know this from community work that everyone is so busy doing the work um, that all the time and space to talk about it to collaborate across um, is is still hard even when you have some resourcing. And so we've had to figure out how to position ourselves not, again not as that center in the hub and spoke, but as often the connector between places. So. I'll hear something in a conversation um, with the folks in India and say, oh my gosh, you have to talk to Fatima in Denver about this because they've just dealt with this on their farm and then we put them together. Um, and so that's been really helpful. And also I think the thing we learned really early on, one of our early mistakes was to be like, yeah, we want them to create courses because we want it to come from communities and not realizing how much anxiety people were going to have about stepping into the role of being a formal educator, even though they're educators in their work all the time. And so as Nissa and Mackenzie got trained into more of the instructional design work and the learning network support work, um, and we did have another person on our team for a period of time, who's not with us anymore, but he um, had a PhD in educational technology and had done a lot of development work. So he created some systems for us some of which were really useful, some of which were a little more in the box than we wanted to be, um, but were, were invaluable in terms of just like getting us strong on the basics. And then as our folks were able to take that and kind of run it through the ethos of the project, we've been able to actually say, okay, we now know where it's valuable for us to step up and take a firmer, more guiding role. Um, and to add capacity, I think at the beginning, in some ways, we were being too deferential. Um, but then as the relationships built, we were more able to say, hey, we can take that off your hands. Mackenzie can talk to you and write the copy from a transcript of what you've said. And now we don't have to push you through a process of like this big looming thing hanging over your head of writing the thing. Give it back to you to check, check for tone, check for content, check for meaning to translate and, and that's worked really, really well. So it's figuring out what skills we also have to help um, that content come together in a way that then becomes accessible to others. Oh, I saw the time. Thanks, Nicole. Absolutely. Um, I think, I think, am I correct that we are over time now and I should probably allow a space for just a lot of gratitude <laughs> um, and um, a reminder that if you have other thoughts, please use any of the links and way, many ways to connect that, um, that I shared earlier. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing folks throughout the next 60 days. Thank you so much for being here, being on this journey with us. Thank you.